if the world can't save countries such as the Maldives today, we won't be able to save places such as London, New York or Hong Kong tomorrow. These are prophetic words that might become a devastating reality in the all too near future. Increasing global temperatures, accelerated melting of our polar ice caps and rising sea levels is setting off a catastrophic chain of events that might threaten the very existence of mankind. And time is running out for our people here in India as well. Maldives' concerns have a close parallel to our very own Lakshadweep group of islands. At just one meter above sea level, the azure waters of the surrounding Arabian Sea take on a foreboding color when you think of its potential of completely flooding the entire island chain. The local inhabitants have not yet realized the gravity of their situation. Lakshadweep, with its few densely inhabited islands and dependent on tourism and fishing, may soon have to look to building its own biblical ark for the deluge that might follow. Sea level rise is one of those which is very clearly tied to rises in global temperature. And in that sense, uh, sea level rise becomes perhaps the leading indicator of climate change. And therefore, coastal communities become the one which have to respond immediately. It is quite simple, really. Rising global temperatures are melting polar ice caps and mountain glaciers at an unprecedented rate. Thus, increasing the volume of water in the oceans. Additionally, rising temperatures are leading to the volumetric expansion of water. Now imagine the effects of this expansion, given that 70% of the Earth is covered with oceans. All this increase in water has to go somewhere, and it eventually will, over our vast coastlines. If we take Lakshwadeep as the barometer of the effects of rise in sea levels, then you're looking at an eventual displacement of 60,000 people from their land. This is just a microcosm of the impact of sea level rise. Experts predict that if Greenland, a major ice sheet which is already showing signs of rapid degleciation, were to melt completely, sea levels would rise by 6 to 7 meters. If this did happen, this is how Mumbai would slowly go underwater, affecting nearly 10 million people in Mumbai alone. Ongoing and anticipated sea level rise places over 60 million people living along the coastal belt of India at high risk. Their vulnerability is a combination of factors. Vulnerability is a complex thing, but the easiest way to think about it is you can actually think about it as a combination of layers on a map. The first layer on a map is your hazard. What kind of hazards do you have? Whether it's your cyclones, whether it's your sea level rise, that describes you the first part of vulnerability. The second part of vulnerability is exposure. Of course, if you had a cyclone on in, a, in an uninhabited part of the coastline, it doesn't matter. What's the density of population? Where do you have settlements? Where do you have cities? How are they located? The third part of vulnerability is really what you might call as adaptive capacity. How prepared are we to cope with the change that we might experience? So in an area that had effective storm shelters, an early warning system, evacuation routes, that would have 
lesser vulnerability than an area that doesn't. So you could think of vulnerability as a composite of combining the hazard with the exposure who is at risk and with the ability of these communities to respond. Mapping of the vulnerable hotspots of our coastline paints a grim picture. Three out of India's five metros are high on the danger zone. Mumbai, our economic capital, is a potential disaster zone with respect to effects of climate change. It scores adversely on all the three markers for vulnerability analysis. Mumbai's topography clearly shows that a substantial area of the city has been built on reclaimed land from the sea, including vital installations like the airport. Many parts of Mumbai exist barely above sea level. Furthermore, mangroves, natural barriers to an advancing sea, have long been lost to make way for high rises and slums. Mumbai, the maximum city, also has the maximum potential of being highly exposed to future sea-related disasters. A city of almost 20 million people, when including its suburbs, it translates to 40,000 persons per square kilometre. Imagine this huge mass of humanity, packed like sardines, and that too in close proximity to the sea. In an emergency situation, civic authorities will be hard-pressed to combat any exposure to the dangers born out of a rise in sea level. Mumbai's adaptive capacity to natural disasters was severely tested and found seriously lacking during the Great Flooding of 2005. Though it was a case of unprecedented and extreme rainfall, what exasperated the situation was the complete lack of infrastructure and bad civic planning. The city's ancient drainage system has only three outfalls inland. The remaining 102 open out directly into the sea. At high tide, as was the case in 2005, there is no way of preventing the massive inflow of seawater into the drainage system. Tackling this situation is now not only a seasonal monsoon affair, but an all-year-round battle. There is concurrence among scientists that there will be a domino effect. One impact of climate change affecting another. For instance, there is conclusive evidence that a rise in sea temperature will lead to more intense cyclones. In combination with rising sea levels, more intense cyclones will lead to an unprecedented multiplier effect of storm surges reaching further and further inland. Rising global temperatures and sea level rise is a lethal combination and there are clearly perceivable consequences for all of humanity. It is not difficult to visualize that the resulting loss of livelihood, damage to agricultural land, property and infrastructure will force the inland migration of our coastal population. It becomes imperative then that we plan today for such an eventuality. All of us buy life insurance, paying for it today to take care of a bad outcome in the future if it does happen. And that's one way to think about climate change. There are many things that we could do today. We have a, a set of uh, regulations for coastal zone, the CRZ regulations. We could look at implementing them effectively and protecting the coastline. 
there are a number of non-structural options we can pursue like mangroves which have demonstrated benefit in reducing the impact from tropical cyclones and stabilizing the coast. We should look at integrating climate change and sea level rise uh, into all of our environmental assessments. So for example, we are building coastal infrastructure, bridges, jetties, ports. Have we taken sea level rise into the design of all of this infrastructure? That's something we can plan for right now. Anything we do today to help better manage floods and sea level rise will of course be of benefit to us in the future. And this is really in the nature of a win-win opportunity. If we are able to better deal with climate uh, risk and climate variability today, we will be much better placed to deal with it in the future. They say that those who forget history are doomed to repeat it again and again. The Great Flood of 2005 is history, but the Great Flood of 2050 might happen sooner than we think and we shall be left awash in disaster at an unprecedented level if we fail to act today. Yes, and